So as folks make their way over from Javits, I'm going to give you the least interesting part of the evening, and that's uh, my segment in which I welcome you here, introduce myself, lay out what we're going to do for the next couple of hours. So first off, thank you very much for coming. As all of you know, Wikibon is a part of SiliconANGLE, which also includes the Cube. So if you look around, this is what we have been doing for the past couple of days here in the Cube. We've been inviting some significant thought leaders from over on the show and in incredibly expensive limousines, driven them up the street to come on to the Cube and spend time with us and talk about some of the things that are happening in the industry today that are especially important. We tore it down, and we're having this party tonight. So we want to thank you very much for coming and look forward to having more conversations with all of you. Now, what are we going to talk about? Well, Wikibon is the research arm of SiliconANGLE. So we take data that comes out of the Cube and other places, and we incorporate it into our research and work very closely with large end users and large technology companies uh, regarding how to make better decisions in this incredibly complex incredibly important transformative world of digital business. What we're going to talk about tonight, and I've got a couple of my analysts assembled, and we're also going to have a panel, is this notion of software is eating the edge. Now, most of you have probably heard Mark Andreessen, uh, the venture capitalist and developer, original developer of Netscape many years ago, talk about how software is eating the world. Well, if software is truly going to eat the world, it's going to eat at, it's going to take the big chunks big bites at the edge. That's where the actual action is going to be. And what we want to talk about specifically is the entangling of the internet or the industrial internet of things and IoT with analytics. So that's what we're going to talk about over the course of the next couple of hours. To do that, we're going to, I've already blown the schedule, that's on me. But to do that, I'm going to spend a couple minutes talking about what we regard as the essential digital business capabilities, which includes analytics and big data and includes IoT, and we'll explain, at least in our position, why those two things come together the way that they do. Then I'm going to ask the august and revered Neil Radin, a Wikibon analyst, to come on up and talk about harvesting value at the edge, because there are some, well, not now, Neil. When, when we're done, when I'm done, then I'm going to ask Neil to come on up, and we'll talk. He's going to talk about harvesting value at the edge, and then Jim Kabilis will follow up with him, another Neil, uh, another uh, Wikibon analyst, and he'll talk specifically about how we're going to take that combination of analytics and edge and turn it into the new types of systems and software that are going to sustain this significant transformation that's going on. And then after that, I'm going to ask Neil and Jim to come. Back. We're going to invite some other folks up, and we're going to run a panel to talk about some of these issues and do a real question and answer. So the goal here is, before we break for drinks, is to create a community feeling within the room that includes smart people here, smart people in the audience, having a conversation, ultimately, about some of these significant changes. So please participate, and, uh, in, and we look forward to talking about the rest of it. All right, so let's get going. What is digital business? One of the nice things about being an analyst is that you can reach back on people who are significantly smarter than you and build your points of view on the shoulders of those giants, including Peter Drucker. Many years ago, Peter Drucker made the observation that the purpose of business is to create and keep a customer, not better shareholder value, not anything else. It is about creating and keeping a customer. Now, you can argue with that. At the end of the day, if you don't have customers, you don't have a business. Now, the observation that we've made, what we've added to that, is that we've made the observation that the difference between business and digital business essentially is one thing. That's data. A digital business uses data to differentially create and keep customers. That's the only difference. If you think about the difference between taxi cab companies here in New York City, many, every cab that I've been in in the last three days has bothered me about Uber. The reason the difference between Uber and a taxi cab company is data. That's the primary difference. It uses, Uber uses data as an asset. And we think this is the fundamental feature of digital business that everybody has to pay attention to. How is a business going to use data as an asset? Is a business using data as an asset? Is a business driving uh, its engagement with customers, the role of its product, et cetera, using data? And if they are, they are becoming a more digital business. 
Now, when we think about that, what we're really talking about is how are they going to put data to work? How are they going to take their customer data and their operational data and their financial data and any other kind of data and ultimately turn that into superior engagement or improved customer experience or more agile operations or increased automation? Those are the kinds of outcomes that we're talking about. But it is about putting data to work. That's fundamentally what we're trying to do within a digital business. Now that leads to an observation about the crucial strategic business capabilities that every business that aspires to be more digital or to be digital has to put in place. And I want to be clear, when I say strategic capabilities, I mean something specific. It's, when you talk about, for example, technology architecture or information architecture, there's this notion of what capabilities does your business need? Your business needs capabilities to pursue and achieve its mission. And in a digital business, these are the capabilities that are now additive to this core question, ultimately, of whether or not a company is a digital business. What are the three cap capabilities? One, you have to capture data. Not just do a good job of it, but better than your competition. You have to capture data better than your competition in a way that is ultimately less intrusive on your markets and on your customers. That's, in many respects, one of the first priorities of the Internet of Things and People, the idea of using sensors and related technologies to capture more data. Once you capture that data, you have to turn it into value. You have to do something with it that creates business value so you can do a better job of engaging your markets and serving your customers. And that essentially is what we regard as the basis of big data, including operations, including financial performance and everything else, but ultimately it's taking this data that's being captured and turning it into value within the business. The last point here is that once you have generated a model or an insight or some other uh, resource that you can act upon, you then have to act upon it in the real world. We call that systems of agency, the ability to enact based on data. Now, I want to spend just a second talking about systems of agency because we think it's an interesting concept and it's something that Jim Kabilis is going to talk about a little bit later. When we say systems of agency, what we're saying is increasingly machines are acting on behalf of a brand. Or systems, combinations of machines and people are acting on behalf of the brand. And this whole notion of agency is the idea that ultimately these systems are now acting as a business's agent they are at the front line of engaging customers. It's an extremely rich proposition that has subtle but crucial implications. For example, I was talking to a uh, senior decision maker at a business today, and they made a quick observation. They talked about the fact that they, on their way here to New York City, they had followed a woman who was going through security, opened up her suitcase, and took out a bird and then went through security with the bird. And the reason why I bring this up now is as TSA was trying to figure out how exactly to deal with this, the bird started talking and repeating things that the woman had said. And many of those things, in fact, might have put her in jail. Now, in this case, the bird is not an agent of that woman. You can't put the woman in jail because of what the bird said. But increasingly, we have to ask ourselves as we ask machines to do more on our behalf, digital instrumentation and elements to do more on our behalf, it's going to have blowback and an impact on our brand if we don't do it well. I want to draw that forward a little bit because it suggests that there's going to be a new life cycle for data. And the way that we think about it is we have the internet or the edge, which is comprised of things and crucially people using sensors, whether they be small arm processors and control towers, or whether they be phones that are tracking where we go. And this crucial element here is something that we call information transducers. Now, a transducer in a traditional sense is something that takes energy from one form to another so that it can perform new types of work. By information transducer, I essentially mean it takes information from one form to another so it can perform another type of work. This is a crucial feature of data. One of the beauties of data is that it can be used in multiple places at multiple times and not in general significant net new costs. It's one of the few assets that you can say about that. So this 
concept of an information transducer is really important because it's the basis for a lot of the transformations of data as data flies through organizations. So we end up with these transducers storing data in the form of analytics, machine learning, business operations, other types of things. And then it goes back and it's transduced back into the real world as we program the real world and turning into these systems of agency. So that's the new life cycle. And increasingly, that's how we have to think about data flows. Capturing it, turning it into value, and having it act on our behalf in front of markets. Well, that's going to have enormous implications for how ultimately money is spent over the next few years. So Wikibon does a significant amount of market research in addition to advising our large user customers. And that includes doing studies on cloud, public cloud, but also studies on what's happening within the analytics world. And if you take a look at it, what we basically see happening over the course of the next few years is significant investments in software and also services to get the word out. But we also expect that there's going to be a lot of hardware, a, a significant amount of hardware that's ultimately sold within this space. And that's because of something that we call true private cloud. This concept of ultimately a business increasingly being designed and architected around the idea of data assets means that the reality, the physical realities of how data operates, how much it costs to store it or move it, the issues of latency, the issues of intellectual property protection, as well as things like the regulatory regimes that are being put in place to govern how data gets used in between locations. All of those factors are going to drive increased utilization of what we call true private cloud. On-premise technologies that provide the cloud experience but act where the data naturally needs to be processed. I'll come a little bit more to that in a second. So we think that it's going to be a relatively balanced market. A lot of stuff is going to end up in the cloud, but as Neil and Jim will talk about, there's going to be an enormous amount of analytics that pulls an enormous amount of data out to the edge because that's where the action is going to be. Now, one of the things I want to also reveal to you is we've done a fair amount of data, about, we've done a fair amount of research around this question of where or, or how will data guide dis, uh, decisions about infrastructure. And in particular, the edge is driving these conversations. So here's a piece of research that uh, one of our cohorts uh, at Wikibon did, David Floyer, taking a look at IoT edge cost comparisons over a three-year period. And it showed on the left-hand side an example where the sensor towers and other types of devices uh, were streaming data back into a central location in a wind farm, stylized wind farm example. Very, very expensive. Significant amounts of money end up being consumed, significant resources end up being consumed by the cost of moving the data from one place to another. Now this is even assuming that latency does not become a problem. The second example that we looked at is if we kept more of that data at the edge and processed it at the edge. And literally, it is a, it is a uh, 85 plus percent cost reduction to keep more of the data at the edge. Now that has enormous implications, how we think about big data, how we think about next generation application architectures, et cetera. But it's these costs that are going to be so crucial to shaping the decisions that we make over the next few years about where we put hardware, where we put resources, what type of automation is possible, and what types of technology management have to be put in place. Ultimately, we think it's going to lead to a structure, an architecture in the infrastructure as well as applications that is informed more by moving cloud to the data than moving the data to the cloud. That's kind of our fundamental proposition is that the norm in the industry is, has been to think about moving all data up to the cloud because who wants to do IT? It's so much cheaper. Look at what Amazon can do or what AWS can do. All true statements, very, very important in many respects. But most businesses today are starting to rethink that, that simple proposition and asking themselves, 
do we have to move our business to the cloud or can we move our cloud to the business? And increasingly, what we see happening as we talk to our large customers about this is that the cloud is being extended out to the edge. We're moving the cloud and cloud services out to the business because of economic reasons, intellectual property control reasons, regulatory reasons, security reasons, any number of other reasons. It's just a more natural way to deal with it. And of course, the most important reason is latency. So with that as a quick backdrop, if I may quickly summarize, we believe fundamentally that the difference today is that businesses are trying to understand how to use data as an asset. And that requires an investment in new sets of technology capabilities that are not cheap, not simple, and require significant thought. A lot of planning, a lot of change within an IT and business organizations. How we capture data, how we turn it into value, and how we translate that into real world action through software. That's going to lead to a rethinking, ultimately, based on costs and other factors, about how we deploy infrastructure, how we use the cloud so that the data guides the activity and not the choice of cloud supplier determines or limits what we can do with our data. And that's going to lead to this notion of true private cloud and elevate the role that the edge plays in analytics and all other architectures. So I hope that was perfectly clear. And now what I want to do is I want to bring up Neil Radin. Yes, now is the time, Neil. So let me invite Neil up to spend some time talking about harvesting value at the edge. Can you see? All right. Got it. Oh, boy. Hi, everybody. Um, yeah, this is, a really, this is a really big and complicated topic, so um, I decided to just concentrate on something fairly simple. Um, but I know that Peter mentioned um, customers, and uh, he also had a picture of Peter Drucker. Uh, I had the pleasure in 1998 of interviewing Peter and photographing him. Peter Drucker, not this Peter. And, uh, and uh, because I had started a magazine called Hired Brains, uh, it was for consultants. And uh, uh, Peter, said, Peter said a number of really interesting things to me, uh, but, but one of them was his definition of a customer was someone who wrote you a check that didn't bounce. <laughs> he, was, he was kind of a wag. Um, <laughs> he was. Um, so anyway, uh, he had to leave to do a video conference with um, um, uh, Jack Welch. And uh, so I said to him, how much do you charge Jack Welch to spend an hour on a video conference? You know, and he said, uh, you know, I have this theory that you should always charge your client enough that it hurts a little bit or they don't take you seriously. Well, I had the chance to talk to uh, Jack's wife, Susie Welch, recently, and I told her that story, and she said, oh, he's full of it. Jack never paid a dime for those conferences. <laughs> So uh, anyway, all right, so, so let's talk about this. Um, to me, um, things about uh, engineered things like uh, hardware and network and all these other standards and so forth, we haven't fully developed those yet, but they're coming. As far as I'm concerned, they're not the most interesting thing. Um, the most interesting thing to me in edge analytics um, is what you're going to get out of it, you know, what, the, what the result is going to be making sense of this data that's coming. Um, and while we're on data, something I've been thinking a lot lately because everybody I've talked to for the last three days just keeps talking to me about data. Um, I, I have this feeling that data isn't actually quite real. Um, that any data that we deal with is the result of some process that's captured it from something else that's actually real. In other words, it's proxy. So it's not exactly perfect. And that's why we've always had these problems about customer A, customer A, customer A, what's their definition, what's the definition of, of, of this, that, and the other thing. Um, and with sensor data, I really have the feeling 
when, when companies get, they're not companies, when organizations get in, uh, uh, instrumented and start dealing with this kind of data, um, what they're going to find is uh, that this is the first time, and, and now I've been involved in analytics, I don't want to date myself because I know I look young, but um, the first, uh, I've been dealing with analytics since 1975, and everything we've ever done in analytics has involved pulling data from some other system that was not designed for analytics. But if you think about sensor data, this is data that we're actually going to catch the first time. It's going to be ours. We're not going to get it from some other source. It's going to be the real deal, to the extent that it's the real deal. Now, you may say, you know, Neil, a sensor that's sending us information about oil pressure or temperature or something like that, how can you quarrel with that? Well, I can quarrel with it because I don't know if the sensor is doing it right. So we still don't know, even with that data, if it's right, but we, that's what we have to work with. Now, what does that really mean is that we have to be real careful with this data. It's ours, we have to take care of it. We don't get to reload it from source some other day. If we munge it up, it's gone forever. So that has, that has very serious implications. But let me, let me roll you back a little bit. Uh, the way I look at analytics is it's come in three different eras and we're entering into the third now. The first era was, you know, business intelligence. Uh, uh, it was basically built and governed by IT. It was system of record kind of reporting. And as far as I can recall, it probably started around 1988, or at least that's the year that Howard Dresner claims to have invented the term. I'm not sure it's true. Um, and things happened before 1988 that were sort of like BI, but 88 was really when they started coming out. That's when you saw business objects and Cognos and MicroStrategy and those guys. The second generation just popped out on everybody else. We were all looking around at BI and we were saying, why isn't this working? You know, why are only five people in the organization using this? Why are we not getting value out of this massive license uh, we bought? Uh, and along comes companies like Tableau doing data discovery, visualization, data prep, and line of business people are using this now. But it's still the same kind of data sources. It's moved out a little bit, but it still hasn't really hit the big data thing. Now we're in third generation, so we not only had big data, which is coming in, it's like a tsunami, um, but we're looking at smart discovery, we're looking at machine learning, uh, we're looking at uh, AI-induced uh, analytics workflows, and then all the natural language cousins, you know, natural language processing, natural language, what's, oh, Q, natural language query, natural language generation. Anybody here know what natural language generation is? Yeah, so what you see now is you do some sort of analysis, and that tool comes up and says, this chart is about the following, and it used the following data. And it's blah, 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 right? Um, I, I think it's kind of wordy and we'll, it's going to get refined some, but it's an, interesting, it's an interesting thing to do. Now, problem I see with edge analytics and IoT in general is that most of the canonical examples we talk about are pretty thin. Well, we talk about autonomous cars. I hope to God we never have them because I'm a car guy. Um, Fleet management, I mean, Qualcomm started fleet management in 1988. That is not a new application. Um, I industrial controls, um, I, seem to remember, I seem to remember Honeywell doing industrial controls at least in the 70s and before that I wasn't, well I don't want to talk about what I was doing but I, <laughs> I definitely wasn't in this industry. Um, so my feeling is we all need to sit down and think about this and get creative because the real value in edge analytics or IoT, whatever you want to call it, the real value is going to be figuring out something that's new or different, creating a brand new business, uh, changing the way an operation happens in a company, right? And uh, I think there's a lot of smart people out there, and I think there's a million apps that we haven't even talked about. So if you as a vendor come to me and tell me how great your product is, please don't talk to me about autonomous cars or fleet management because I've heard about that, okay? Now, hardware and architecture are really not the most interesting thing. We fell into that trap with data warehousing. Uh, we've fallen into that trap with big data. We talk about speeds and feeds. Um, somebody said to me the other day, 
What's the narrative of this company? This is a, a technology provider. And I said, as far as I can tell, they don't have a narrative. They have some products, and they compete in a space. And when they go to clients and the clients say, what's the value of your product? They, they don't have an answer for that. So we don't want to fall into this trap, OK? Um, because, because IoT is going to inform you in ways you've never even dreamed about. Unfortunately, some of them are going to be really stinky. You know, they're going to be really bad. Um, you're going to lose more of your privacy. Uh, it's going to be harder to get, I don't know, a mortgage, for example. I don't know, maybe it'll be easier. But in any case, it's not going to all be good. So let's really think about what you want to do with this technology to do something that's really valuable. Um, cost takeout is not the place to justify an IoT project. Because number one, it's very expensive. Um, and number two, uh, it's a waste of the technology because you should be looking at, you know, the old numerator denominator thing? You should be looking at the numerators and forget about the denominators because that's not what you do uh, with, uh, with IoT. Uh, and the other thing is you don't want to get overconfident. Actually, this is good advice about anything, right? Um, but in, in this case, uh, I love this quote um, by, by Derek Sivers. He's a pretty funny guy. He said, if more information was the answer, then we'd all be billionaires with perfect abs. Now, you know, I'm not sure what's on his wish list, but uh, you know, I, I would. Those aren't necessarily the two things I would think of. Okay. Now, what I said about the data, uh, I want to explain some more. Big data analytics. If you look at this graphic, it depicts it perfectly. It's a bunch of diff different stuff falling into the funnel. All right. Um, it, it, it comes from other places. It's not original material. And when it comes in, it's always used or secondhand data. Now, what does that mean? That means that you have to figure out the semantics of this information, and you have to find a way to put it together in a way that's useful to you. Okay? That's big data. That's where we are. How is that different from IoT data? It's like I said, IoT is original. You can put it together any way you want because no one else has ever done that before. Right? It's yours to construct. Okay? Um, you don't even have to transform it into a schema because you're creating the new application. Uh, but the most important thing is you have to take care of it because if you lose it, it's gone. It's the original data. It's the same way you know, in, in operational systems for a long, long time, we've always been concerned about backup and, and security and everything else. You better believe this is a problem. I know a lot of people think about streaming data, that we're going to look at it for a minute, and we're going to throw most of it away. Personally, I, I, I don't think that's going to happen. I think it's all going to be saved, or at least for a while. Now, uh, governance and security. Uh, by the way, I don't know where you're going to find a presentation where somebody uses a newspaper clipping about Vladimir Lenin. Um, but here it is. Enjoy yourselves. Um, I believe that when people think about governance and security today, uh, they're still thinking along the same grids uh, that we thought about it all along. But this is very, very different. And again, I, I, I'm sorry I keep thrashing this around, uh, but this is, this is treasured data that has to be carefully uh, taken care of. Now, when I say governance, uh, my experience has been over the years uh, the governance is something that IT does to make everybody's lives miserable. Uh, but that's not what I mean by governance today. It means a comprehensive program to really secure the value of the data as an asset. Okay? And you need to think about this differently. Now, the other thing is you may not get to think about it differently because some of this stuff may end up being subject to regulation. And if the regulators start regulating some of this, then that'll take some of the, you know, the degrees of freedom away from you and how you put this together, but you know, that's, that's the way it works. Now, machine learning. I think I told somebody the other day that claims about machine learning in software products are as common as twisters and trailer parks. Um, and a lot of it is not really what I'd call machine learning. Uh, but there's a lot of it around, and I think all of, the, all of the open source machine learning and artificial intelligence that's popped up, uh, it's great. 
because all those math PhDs who work at Home Depot now have something to do when they go home at night and, uh, and they construct this stuff. But um, if you're going to have machine learning at the edge, here's the question. What kind of machine learning would you have at the edge as opposed to developing your models back at, say, the cloud when you transmit the data there? The, the devices at the edge are not very powerful and they don't have a lot of memory. So you're only gonna be able to do things that have been modeled or constructed somewhere else. But that's okay. Um, because machine learning algorithm development is actually slow and painful. So you really want the people who know how to do this, working with gobs of data, creating you know, models and testing them offline. And when you have something that works, you can put it there. Now, there's one thing I wanna, I wanna talk about before I'm finished, and I think I'm almost finished. Um, I wrote a book about 10 years ago about automated decision making. And the conclusion that I came up with was that little decisions add up, and that's good. But it also means you don't have to get them all right. But you don't want computers or software making decisions unattended if it involves human life, or frankly, any life. Right? or the environment. So when you think about the applications that you can build you know, using this architecture and this technology, think about the fact that you're not going to be doing air traffic control. You're not going to be monitoring uh, crossing guards at the elementary school. Um, you're going to be doing things that you know, may seem fairly mundane. Um, managing machinery in a factory floor, I mean, that may sound great, but it really isn't that interesting. Um, managing wellheads, uh, drilling for oil, well, I mean, it, it's great to the extent that it doesn't cause you know, wells to explode, but they don't usually explode. Um, what it's usually used for is to drive the cost out of uh, preventative maintenance. Not very interesting. So use your heads, come up with really cool stuff. And any of you who are involved in edge analytics, the next time I talk to you, I don't wanna hear about the same five applications that everybody talks about. Let's hear about some new ones. So in conclusion, I don't really have anything in conclusion, except that um, uh, Peter mentioned something about limousines bringing people up here. Um, on Monday, I was uh, slogging up and down Park Avenue and, uh, and Madison Avenue with my client, and we were visiting all the hedge funds there because we were doing project with them and, uh, in the miserable weather. And I looked at him and I said, for God's sake, Paul, you know, where's the black car? And he said, that was the 90s. <laughs> Thank you. So, Jim, up, up to you. Okay. Uh, this is a terrible, we're going that way. This is terrible coming that way. We don't want to trip. And let's move to, there we go. Hi, everybody. How are you doing? Thanks, Neil. Thanks, Peter. Those were great. Great discussion. So um, my, I'm the third uh, leg in this relay race here. Um, talking about, how, of course, how software um, is, is, is eating the world. Um, and focusing on the value of uh, edge analytics uh, in a lot of real world scenarios, programming the real world for, you know, to make the world a better place. So I will talk, I'll break it out analytically in terms of the research that Wikibon is doing in the area of the IoT, but specifically how AI um, intelligence is being embedded really into all material reality potentially at the edge. Um, but you know, mobile applications and industrial IoT and, uh, and the smart appliances and self-driving vehicles, I will break it out in terms of a reference architecture for understanding what functions are being pushed to the edge, to hardware, um, to our phones and so, so forth to drive various scenarios in terms of real world results. Um, and so I'll move a, a pace here. So you know, basically, AI software, AI microservices are being infused into edge hardware as we speak. What we see is more uh, vendors of smartphones and other you know, and, and real world appliances and things like smart driving, uh, uh, self-driving vehicles. Um, are, what they're doing is that they're instrumenting their products with computer vision and natural language processing, environmental awareness, based on sensing and actuation and those capabilities and inferences that these devices just do. 
to both provide human support for human users of these devices, as well as to enable varying degrees of autonomous operation. So what, I'm, what I'll be talking about is how AI is a foundation for data-driven systems of agency of the sort that Peter is, is talking about, infusing data-driven intelligence into everything, or potentially so. As more of this capability, all these algorithms, for things like you know, for doing real-time predictions and classifications, anomaly detection, and so forth, as this, uh, this functionality gets diffused widely and becomes more commoditized, you'll see it burned into ever, an ever wider variety of hardware architectures, neuro neurosynaptic chips, GPUs, and so forth. So what I've got here in front of you is a, is a sort of a high-level reference architecture that we're building out in our research at, at Wikibon. So AI, artificial intelligence, is a big term, a big paradigm. I'm not going to unpack it completely. Of course, we don't have you know, oodles of time, so I'm going to uh, take you fairly quickly through the high points. It's a driver for systems of agency, you know, programming the real world, um, transducing digital inputs, the data, to analog real world results. Um, through the uh, embedding of this capability in the IoT, but pushing more and more of it out to the edge, the points of decision and action in real time. And there's four, the four capabilities um, that we're seeing in terms of AI enabled, enabling capabilities that are absolutely critical to software being pushed to the edge are sensing, actuation, inference, and learning. Sen sensing and actuation, like Peter was describing, it's about capturing data from the environment within which a device or a user is, is, is operating or moving. And then actuation is you know, the fancy term for doing stuff. Um, you know, like in industrial IoT, it's obviously machine controls. But clearly, you know, self-driving vehicles, it's steering a vehicle and avoiding crashing and so forth. Inference is the meat and potatoes, as it were, of AI. Analytics does inferences. It infers from the data, the logic of the application, predictive logic, correlations, uh, you know, classification, abstractions, um, differentiation, anomaly detection, recognizing faces and voices. We see that now with Apple in the latest version of the, um, the, um, the iPhone is embedding face recognition as a core, as the core multi-factor authentication technique. Clearly, that's a harbinger of what's going to be universal fairly soon, which is that depends on AI. That depends on convolutional neural networks. That is some heavy hitting processing power that's necessary. And it's processing the data that's coming from your face. So that's critically important. So what we're looking at then is that AI software is taking root in hardware to, to power continuous agency, getting stuff done power decision support by human beings who have to take varying degrees of action in various environments. We don't necessarily want to let the car steer itself in all scenarios. They want some degree of override. Uh, for lots of good reasons, they want to protect life and limb, including their own. And, uh, and just more data-driven automation across the Internet of Things in the broadest sense. So unpacking this reference framework, um, What's happening is that AI-driven intelligence is powering real-time decisioning at the edge. You know, real-time local sensing from the data that it's capturing there, it's ingesting the data. Some, not all, of that data may be persisted at the edge. Some, perhaps most of it, will be pushed into the cloud for other processing. You know, what we're, when you have these highly complex um, algorithms, uh, that are doing AI, you know, deep learning, uh, multi-layer to, to do a variety of, you know, like anti-fraud and you know, higher level like narrative, auto -narr narrative roll-ups from, you know, various scenes that are unfolding. A lot of this processing is going to happen in the cloud, but a fair amount of the more, of the more um, uh, narrowly scoped inferences that drive real-time decision support at the point of action will be done on the device itself. You know, contextual actuation. So it's the sensor data that's captured by the device, along with other data that may be coming down in, in real-time streams from the, you know, through the cloud, um, will provide the broader con contextual you know, envelope of data needed to drive actuation, to drive various models and rules and so forth that are making stuff happen at the point of action at the edge. Um, continuous inference. You know, what it all comes down to is that inference is, is, the, is what's going on inside the chips um, at the edge device. And what we're seeing is a growing range of hardware architectures 
GPUs, CPUs, FPGAs, ASICs, neurosynaptic chips of all sorts, playing in various combinations that are automating more and more uh, very complex in inference scenarios at the edge. And not just individual devices, swarms of devices like drones and so forth are essentially an edge unto themselves. You'll see these, these tiered hierarchies of edge um, um, swarms um, that are playing and doing inferences of ever more complex dynamic nature. And much of this will be, this capability, the fundamental capabilities that is powering them all will be burned into the hardware that, that powers them. And then adaptive learning. Now, I use the term learning rather than training here. Training is at the core of it. Training means everything in terms of the predictive fitness or the fitness of your AI services for whatever task, predictions, classifications, face recognition that you've, 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 you've built them for. But I use the term learning in a broader sense. It's what makes your inferences get better and better, more accurate over time. Is you're, you're training them with fresh data in a supervised learning environment. But you can have reinforcement learning if you're doing, like, say, robotics and you don't have ground truth uh, against which to train the, the data set. Um, you know, there's maximize a reward function versus minimize a loss function, you know, the, the standard approach, uh, the latter for supervised learning. There's also, of course, um, the, um, the, the issue, or not the issue, the approach of um, unsupervised learning with cluster analysis, critically important in a lot of real world scenarios. So edge AI algorithms, you know, clearly deep learning, which is multi-layered machine learning models that uh, can uh, do abstractions at higher and higher levels. Face recognition is a high level abstraction. Faces in a, in, in a social environment is an even higher level abstraction in terms of groups. Faces over time and bodies and gestures doing various things in various environments is an even higher level abstraction in terms of narratives that can be rolled up, are being rolled up by deep learning uh, capabilities of, of greater sophistication. Um, convolutional neural networks for processing images, recurrent neural networks for processing time series, generative adversarial networks for doing essentially what's called generative, um, generative uh, applications of all sort, you know, composing music and uh, and, and Korea, it, a lot of it's being used for auto programming. These are all deep learning. And there's a variety of other algorithmic approaches I'm not going to bore you with here. Deep learning is, is essentially the enabler of the five senses of the IoT. Your phone's going to have, has a camera. It has, you know, a microphone. Um, it has the ability to, of course, it has geolocation and navigation capabilities. Um, it's environmentally aware. It's got an accelerometer and so forth embedded there, therein. The reason that your phone and every, all other devices are getting scary uh, sentient, sentient um, is that they have the sensory modalities and the AI, the deep learning, that enables them to make environmentally correct decisions in a wider range of scenarios. So machine learning is the foundation of all this, but there are other I mean, of deep learning. And artificial neural networks is the foundation of that. But there are other approaches for machine learning I want to make you aware of because support vector machines and these other established approaches for machine learning are not going away. But really what's uh, driving the show now is deep learning because it's scary effective. Um, and that's where most of the in, uh, investment in AI is going into these days for deep learning. Um, AI edge platforms, tools and frameworks are just coming along like, along like gangbusters. Most, much development of AI, of deep learning, happens in the context of your data lake. This is where you're storing your training data. It's the data that you use to build and test and validate your models. Um, so we're seeing a deepening stack of you know, Hadoop, and there's Kafka, and Spark, and so forth, that are driving the training <coughs> excuse me, of AI um, models that are powering all these edge analytic applications. So that, that, that lake will continue to broaden in terms and deepen in terms of the scope and the range of data sets and the range of, of, of modeling, uh, uh, AI modeling uh, that it supports. Data science is critically important in this uh, scenario because the data scientists, data science teams, the, the tools and techniques and flows of data science are the fundamental development paradigm or, di or discipline or ca capability that's, that's being leveraged to build and to train and deploy and iterate um, all this AI that's being pushed to the edge. So clearly, data science is at the center. Data scientists of an increasingly specialized nature are necessary to the realization of this value at the edge. AI frameworks are coming along like you know a mile a minute 
TensorFlow has achieved a, is an open source, most of these are open source, has achieved sort of a, almost like a de facto standard, uh, a, uh, you know, a status. I would, you know, I, I'm using the word de facto in air quotes. But there's Theano and Keras and MXNet and CNTK and a variety of other ones. We're getting, we're seeing a broader range of AI frameworks come to market, most open source. Most are supported by most of the major tool vendors as well. Um, so Wikibon, we're definitely tracking that, and we plan to go deeper in our coverage of that, that space. Um, and then next best action, powers recommendation engines. I mean, next best, a next, next best action, decision automation of the sort that Neil has covered in a variety of contexts in his career, um, is fundamentally important to, the, to edge analytics, to systems of agency, because it's driving the, the you know, process automation, decision automation, sort of the targeted recommendations that are made at, at the edge to in individual users, as well as the process that automation, you know, that's absolutely necessary for self-driving vehicles to do their jobs and industrial IoT. So what we're seeing is more and more recommendation engine or recommender capabilities powered by ML and DL are going to the edge, are already at the edge for a variety of applications. Um, edge AI capabilities, like I said, there's sensing, and sensing at the edge is becoming ever more rich, mixed reality, edge modalities of all sort, or for augmented reality and, um, and, and so forth. We're just seeing a, 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 you know, a, a growth in certain, so the range of sensory modalities that are enabled or filtered and analyzed through AI that are being pushed to the edge into the chipsets. Actuation, that's where robotics comes in. Robotics is coming into all aspects of our lives. And you know it's 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 it's, it's brainless without without AI without deep learning and these capabilities, inference autonomous edge decisioning like I said it's the, 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 a growing range of inferences that are being done at the edge and that's where it has to happen because that's the point of decision, learning, training tr much training most training will continue to be done in the cloud because it's very data intensive, it's you know it's a grind to train. And, and optimize an AI algorithm to do its job. It's not something that you necessarily want to do or can do at the edge, at edge devices. So the models that are built and trained in the cloud are pushed down through a DevOps you know, process down to the edge. And that's the way it will work pretty much uh, in most AI environments, most, ed most edge analytics environments. You centralize the modeling. You decentralize the execution of the inference models. The training engines will be in the cloud. Edge AI applications, I'll just run you through uh, sort of a, a core list of the ones that are coming into the, already come into the mainstream at the edge. Multi-factor authentication, clearly the, uh, the Apple uh, you know, the announcement of face recognition is just a harbinger of the fact that that's coming to every device. Computer vision, speech recognition, NLP, <clears throat> digital assistance and chatbots powered by natural language processing and understanding. It's all AI powered and it's, it's becoming very mainstream. Emotion detection, face recognition, you know, I can go on and on, but these are like the core things that will, everybody has access to or will by 2020 in the core devices, mass market devices. Um, developers, designers, and hardware engineers are coming together to pool their expertise to build and train not just the AI, but also the entire package of hardware and UX and, and the orchestration of real world business scenarios or, or life scenarios that all this intelligence, this embedded intelligence enables. And most, much of, of what they build in terms of AI will be containerized as microservices through Docker and orchestrated through Kubernetes as full cloud services in an increasingly distributed fabric. That's coming along very rapidly. We can see a fair amount of that already on display at Strata in terms of what the vendors um, are doing or announcing or who they're working with. The hardware itself, the edge, you know, at the edge, some data will be persistent, needs to be persistent to drive inference. That's, you know, or, and you know, to drive um, a, a variety of different uh, application scenarios that need some degree of historical data related to what that device in question happens to be sensing or has sense in, sensed in the, you know, the immediate past or you know, whatever. Um, the hardware itself is geared towards both sensing and pers increasing the persistence and edge-driven actuation of real-world results. You know, the whole notion of drones and robotics being embedded into everything that we do, that's where that comes in. That has to be powered by low-cost, low-power, um, you know, uh, commodity chipsets of various sorts. 
What we see right now in terms of chipsets is it's a GPUs. NVIDIA has gone real far, and GPUs have uh, come out along very fast in terms of powering inference engines for, you know, like the Tesla cars and so forth. But GPUs are, in many ways, the core hardware substrate for inference engines in DL so far. But to become a mass market phenomenon, it's got to get cheaper and lower powered um, and more commoditized. And so we see a fair number of CPUs being used as the hardware for edge analytic applications. Some vendors um, are fairly big on FPGAs. I believe Microsoft has, has gone fairly far with FPGAs inside their DL strategy. Um, ASICs, I mean, there's neurosynaptic chips like, like you know, IBM's got one. There's, a, there's at least a few dozen vendors of neurosynaptic chips on the market. So at Wikibon, we're going to track that market as it, as it develops. Um, and what we're seeing is a fair number of scenarios where it's a mixed uh, uh, environment where you use uh, one chipset architecture at the inference uh, side of the edge and other chipset architectures that are driving the DL that's processed in the cloud playing together within a common architecture. And we see some, a fair number of DL environments where the actual training is done in the cloud on Spark using CPUs and parallelized in memory, but pushing like TensorFlow models that might be trained with, through Spark uh, down to the edge where the inferences are done in you know, FPGAs and, and GPUs. Those kinds of mixed hardware scenarios are very, uh, very uh, likely to be uh, the, the standard going forward in lots of areas. So analytics at the edge power continuous results is what it's all about. The whole point you know, is really not moving the data. It's putting the inference, inference at the edge and working from the data that's already captured and persisted there um, for, the, for the duration of whatever you know, action or decision or result needs to be powered from the edge. Like Neil said, cost takeout alone is not worth doing. It, 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 cost takeout alone is not the rationale for putting AI at the edge. It's getting new stuff done, new kinds of things done in an automated, consistent, intelligent, contextualized way to make our lives better and more productive. Security and governance are becoming more important. Governance of the models, governance of the data, governance in a DevOps context in terms of version controls over all those DL models that are, that are, that are built, that are trained, that are containerized and deployed, continuous iteration and improvement of those to help them learn to do, make our lives better and easier. And with that said, I'm going to hand it over now. It's five minutes after the hour. We're going to get going with the influencer panel. So what we'd like to do is I like to call Peter, and Peter's going to call our influencers. All right. Am I live again? Can you hear me? All right. So uh, we've got, uh, let me jump back and control here. We've got, uh, again, the objective here is to have a community take on some things. And so what we want to do is I want to invite uh, five other people up. Neil, why don't you come on up as well? Start with, start with Neil. You can sit here. Uh, on the far right-hand side, uh, Judith. Judith Hurwitz. I'm glad I'm on the left From side. From the Hurwitz group. <laughs> From the Hurwitz group. Jennifer Shen, who is affiliated with UC Berkeley. Jennifer, are you here? She's here. Jennifer, where are you? Here a second ago. I saw her walk out. She may have. All right, she'll be back in a second. So uh, here's Joseph, Jennifer. Oh, here's Jennifer with Eight Path Solutions, right? Yep. Yeah, Eight Path Solutions. I just get my mic. Here we go. Take your time, Jennifer. All right. Oh, this lights. Uh, Stephanie McReynolds. Far left. <coughs> and finally, Joe Caserta. <coughs> Joe, come on up. Stephanie's with Alicia. Middle left. So what I want to do is I want to start by having everybody just go around, introduce yourself quickly. Judith, why don't we start there? I'm uh, Judith Hurwitz. I'm president of Hurwitz & Associates. We're a, an analyst research uh, and thought leadership firm. I'm the co-author of eight books. Uh, most recent is Cognitive Computing and Big Data Analytics. I uh, have been in the market for a couple of years now. Jennifer. Hi. My name is Jennifer Shin. I'm the founder and chief data scientist at ETAP Solutions. LLC, do data science, analytics, and technology. We're actually about to do a, a big launch test this month uh, with Box, actually. So we're we're are we having a, sorry, Jennifer, are we having a problem with Jennifer's microphone? You need to turn it back on. Oh. oh, you have to turn it back on. Who's on? Oh, sorry. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. Okay, I don't know how that turned back off. But okay. So you get, a, you get a redo on that. Jennifer. Okay, so my name is Jennifer Shin. I'm the founder of 8Path Solutions, LLC. 
the data science, analytics, and technology company. I founded about six years ago. So we've been developing some really cool technology that we're going to be launching with Box uh, next month. It's really exciting. Um, and I have, I've been developing a lot of patents and some technology as well as um, teaching at UC Berkeley as a lecturer in data science. You know Jim? You know Neil? Joe, you ready to go? Mm, Joe's microphone is broken. Uh, should be all right. Speaking of meals. Hello, hello. <laughs> and I just feel not worthy in the presence of Joe Caserta. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, master of mics. Uh, all right. If you can hear me, uh, Joe okay. Caserta. So you yeah, have been doing data technology solutions for, since 1986, almost, almost as old as Neil here, but uh, been. <laughs> doing uh, specifically like BI, data warehousing, business intelligence uh, type of work since 1996 and been doing uh, de wholly dedicated to big data solutions and modern data engineering since 2009. Where should I be looking? Um, and, uh, yeah, I don't know. Where's the camera? Yeah. And, um, and, and that's basically it. So my company was formed in 2001. It's called Caserta Concepts. We re recently... Re it. Recently rebranded to only Caserta, because what we do is way more than just concepts. Um, so we, we conceptualize the stuff, we vision what's, what the future brings, and then we actually build it. Um, and we help clients, large and small, uh, who are just uh, want to be leaders in innovation using data specifically to advance their, their business. And finally, Stephanie McReynolds. I'm Stephanie McReynolds. Uh, I had product marketing as well as corporate marketing for a company called Alation. And we are a, a data catalog, so we help uh, bring together not only a, a technical understanding of your data, but we uh, curate that data with human knowledge and use automated intelligence internally within the system to make recommendations about um, what data to use for decision making. And some of our customers, like City of San Diego, um, a large automotive manufacturer working on self-driving uh, cars, and uh, General Electric use uh, Alation to help power their solutions for IoT at the, at the edge. All right, so let's jump right into it. And again, if you have a question, raise your hand and we'll do our best to get it to the floor. Uh, but what I want to do is I want to get uh, seven questions in front of this group and have you guys discuss, slog, disagree, agree. Let's start here. What is the relationship between big data, AI, and IoT? Now, Wikibon's put forward its observation uh, that data is being generated at the edge, that action is being taken at the edge, and then increasingly the software and other infrastructure architectures need to accommodate the realities of how data is going to work uh, in these very complex systems. That's our perspective. Um, anybody, Judith, you want to start? Yeah, so, so I think that um that if, if you look at AI, machine learning, all of these different um, areas, uh, you, you, ha you have to be able to have the data learn. Um, now, when it comes to IoT, I think one, one of the issues we have to be careful about, it's not all data will be at the edge. Not all data needs to be analyzed at the edge. For example, if the light is green, and that's good and it's supposed to be green, do you really have to constantly analyze the fact that the light is green? You actually really only want to be able to analyze and take action when, the, when there's an anomaly. Well, if it goes purple, that's actually a sign that something might explode. So that's where you want to make sure that you have the analytics at the edge, not for everything, but for the things where there is an anomaly and a change. Joe, how about from your perspective? For me, I think um, the evolution of data is really becoming the, you know, eventually oxygen is just, I mean, data is going to be the oxygen we breathe. Um, I, you know, it used to be very, very reactive and, and there used to be a lot of latency. You, you do something, there's a behavior, there's an event, there's a transaction, and then you go record it and then you collect it and then you can analyze it. And it was very, very, you know, waterfallish, right? And then eventually we figured out to put it back into the system, or at least have uh, human beings interpret it to try to make the system better. And that is really completely turned on its head. We don't do that anymore. Right now, it's very, very, it's um, synchronous. Where, like, as we're actually making these transactions, the, the machines, we don't really need. I mean, 
human beings are involved a bit, but I, less and less and less. And it's just a reality, maybe not politically correct to say, but it's a reality that you know my phone in my pocket is following my behavior and it knows without telling a human being what I'm doing and it can actually help me do things like get to where I want to go faster uh, depending on my preference if I want to you know save money or save time or um, or visit things along the way and I think that's all integration of big data streaming data um, artificial intelligence and I think the next thing that we're going to start seeing is the culmination of all of that I actually Hopefully it'll be published soon. I just wrote an article for Forbes with the new term of RB. And RB is the, uh, the integration of, of augmented reality and business intelligence. Mm. Where I think eventually we're going to see, you know, hold your phone up to, you know, to, uh, to Jim's face and it's going to recognize it's gonna break. It, And it's going to say <laughs> exactly, you know, what, what are the key metrics that we want to know about Jim? If he works on my sales force, What's his attainment of goal? What is what? Can it read my mind? What deals uh, potentially okay. based on behavior patterns? Okay. Right? So um, that, you know, I'm it, scared. I don't, I don't it, think Jim's mind it can it can, it will without a doubt be able to predict you know what you've done in the past. You may with some certain level of confidence you may, you may do again in the future, right? And um, is that mind reading? It's pretty close. Right? Mm. Well, sometimes I mean mind reading is in the eye of the individual who wants to know. And if the machine appears to approximate what's going on in the person's head, sometimes you can't tell. So I guess I guess we could call that the well, Turing machine test of the paranormal. Well, face recognition, micro gesture recognition. I mean, facial uh, gestures. People can do it. Not maybe not better than a coin toss, but if it can be seen visually and captured and analyzed, conceivably, some degree of mind reading can be built in. I can see when somebody's angry looking at me. So that's a possibility. And it's absolutely. kind of a scary possibility um, when in a surveillance society, you know, potentially. Right. Absolutely. Stephanie, what do you think? Well, I hear a world of it's the bots versus the humans being painted here. And I think that, um, you know, at Alation, we have a very strong perspective on this. And that is that the the greatest impact or the greatest results is going to be when humans figure out how to collaborate with the machines. And so yes, you want to get to the location more quickly. Um, but the machine isn't, the bot isn't able to tell you exactly what to do when you're just going to blindly follow it. You need to train that machine. You need to have a partnership with that machine. So um, you know, a lot of the, the power, and I think this goes back to Judah's story, is in what is the human decision making that can be augmented with data from the machines, but then the humans are actually training the the training set and driving machines in the right direction. And I think that's when we get true power out of some of these solutions. So it's not just all about the technology. It's not all about the data or the AI or the IoT. It's about how that empowers human systems to become smarter and more effective and more efficient. And I think we're, we're playing that out in our technology in a certain way. And I think um, organizations that are, that are thinking along those lines um, with IoT are seeing more benefits immediately from those projects. So I think we have a general agreement of what kind of some of the things you talked about, IoT, crucial to capturing information and then having action being taken, uh, AI being crucial to defining and refining the nature of the actions that are being taken, and big data ultimately powering how a lot of that changes. Oops. Let's go to the next one. So I actually have something to add to that. Whoops. So I think it makes sense, right, with uh, IoT, why we have big data associated with it. If you think about what data is collected by IoT, we're talking about um, a serial information, right? It's over time. It's going to grow exponentially, just by definition, right? So every minute you collect a piece of information, that means over time it's going to keep growing, growing, growing as it accumulates. So you know that's one of the reasons why the IoT is so strongly associated with big data. And also why you need AI to be able to differentiate between you know, one minute versus the next minute, right? Trying to find a better way rather than looking at all of that information and manually picking out you know, patterns to have some automated process for being able to filter through that much data that's being collected. I want to point out though, based on what you just said, Jennifer, I want to bring Neil in at this point, that this question of IoT now generating unprecedented levels of data does introduce this idea of the primary source. Mm -hmm. Historically, what we've done within technology, or within, I, within IT certainly, is we've taken stylized data. There is no such thing as a real world accounting thing. It is a human contrivance. And we stylize data, and therefore it's relatively easy to be very precise on it. But when we start, as you noted, 
when we start measuring things with a tolerance down to you know thousandths of a millimeter, whatever that is, yeah. me metric system, now we're still sometimes dealing with uh, errors that we have to attend to. So the reality is we're not just dealing with stylized data, we're re dealing with real data, and it's more, more frequent, but it also has special cases that we have to attend to as in terms of how we use it. What do you think, Neil? Well, I, mean, I, I agree with that. I think I already said that, right? Yes, you did. Okay, but, let's uh, move on to the next one. <laughs> well, it's a doppelganger, the digital twin doppelganger that's automatically <clears throat> created by your very fact that you're living and uh, interacting and so forth and so on. It's going to accumulate regardless. Now, that doppelganger may not be your agent or might not be the foundation for your agent unless there's some other piece of logic like an interest graph that you build, a human being, saying, this is my broad set of interests, and so all of my agents out there in the IoT, you all need to be aware that when you make a decision on my behalf as my agent, this is what Jim would do. You know, I mean, there needs to be that kind of logic somewhere in this fabric to enable true agency. All right, so uh, I'm gonna start with you. I, I, oh, go I, ahead. I have a real short answer to this, though. Um, I think that uh, big data provides the, uh, the data and compute platform to make AI possible. Uh, for those of us who dipped our toes in the water in the 80s, we got clobbered because we didn't, have the, we didn't have the facilities, we didn't have the resources to really do AI. We just kind of played around with it. Um, and I think that the other thing about it is if you combine big data and AI and IoT, what you're going to see is people, a lot of the applications we develop now are very inward looking. We look at our organization, we look at our customers. We try to figure out how to sell more shoes to fashionable ladies, right? But with this technology, I think people can really expand what they're thinking about and what they model and come up with applications that are much more external. Actually, what I would ask that is also, it actually introduces being able to um, use engineering, right? Having engineers interested in data, because it's actually technical data that's collected, not just, say, preferences or information about people, but actual measurements that are being collected um, with IoT. So I think it's really interesting in the engineering space, because it opens up um, a whole new world for the engineers to actually look at data and to actually, you know, combine both that hardware side as well as the data that's being collected from it. Well, Neil, you and I have talked about something, because it's not just engineers. Um, we have, uh, it, in the healthcare industry, for example, which you know a fair amount about, is this notion of empirical-based management. And the idea that increasingly we have to be driven by data as a way of improving the way that managers do things, the way that managers collect or collaborate, and ultimately collectively how they take action. So it's not just engineers. It's supposed to also inform business. What's actually happening in the healthcare world when we start thinking about some of this empirical-based management? Is it working? What it's are some of the a, barriers? It's not a function of technology. Uh, wh what happens in, in medicine and healthcare research is, I, I guess you could say it borders on fraud. Uh, is that, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not kidding. Um, I know here. the New England Journal of Medicine a couple of years ago released a study and said that at least half their articles that they published turned out to be written ghostwritten by pharmaceutical companies, <laughs> right? So I, I think the problem is that when you do a clinical study, um, the one that really killed me about 10 years ago was the Women's Health Initiative. They spent $700 million gathering this data over 20 years. And when they released it, they looked at all the wrong things, deliberately, right? So that, I, I, don't, I think that's a, that's a, sy I, a systemic. I think you're, you're bringing up a really important point yeah. that we haven't brought up yet, and that is, is can you use big data and machine learning to begin to take the biases out? So if you let the, you know, if, if, if you divorce your preconceived notions and your biases from the data and let the data yeah. lead you to the, to the logic, you, you, you start to, I think, get, get better over time. But it's going to take a while to get there because we do tend to gravitate towards our biases. I, I will share an anecdote. So I had uh, some, some arm pain, and I had numbness in my thumb and pointer finger, and I went to, it was excruciating pain and went to the hospital. So, so the doctor examined me, and he, he said, you know, you probably have a pinched nerve. He said, but I'm not exactly sure which nerve it would be. I'll be right back. And I kid you not, he went to a computer, and he Googled it. And, <laughs> And, and it came back because this little bit of information was something that can easily be looked up, right? Every, every nerve in your spine is connected to your different fingers. So this, the pointer and the thumb just happens to be your C6. 
So he came back and said, it's your C6, right? This one, this one. And there. <laughs> one, you know, an interesting thing, I mean, that's a good example. One of the issues with healthcare data is that the data set is not always shared across the entire research community. So by making big data accessible to everyone, you actually start a more rational conversation or debate on, well, what are the true insights? If that, that conversation includes what, includes what Judith talked about, the actual model that you use to set priorities and make decisions about what's actually important. So it's not just about improving, this is the test, it's not just about improving uh, a, your understanding of the wrong thing, it's also testing whether it's the right or wrong thing as That's well. That's right, and to be able to test that, you need to have humans in dialogue with one another, bringing different biases to the table to work through, okay, is there because truth it's, in it's this data? Because it's context and, and it's correlation, and, and, and you can have a great correlation that's garbage, you know, if, if you don't have the right context. So it's, I want to, hold, hold on, Jim, I want to, hold on, Jim, I want to take it to the next question, because I want to build off of what you talked about, Stephanie, and that is that this says something about what is the edge. Now, our perspective is that the edge is not just devices. That when we talk about the edge, we're talking about human beings and the role that human beings are going to play, both as sensors or carrying things with them, but also as actuators, actually taking action, which is not uh, a simple thing. So what do you guys think? What does the edge mean to you? Joe, why don't you start? Well, I think it could be a combination of the two. And uh, specifically when we talk about healthcare, so, I, you know, I, I believe in 2017, you know, when we eat, we don't know why we're eating. Like, I think we, we should absolutely by now be able to know exactly, you know, what is my protein level? What is my calcium level? What is my potassium level? And then find the foods to, to meet that. What have I depleted versus what I should have? And eat very, very purposely and not by taste. And, and it's by, amazing that by red accident. wine is always the answer. It is. <laughs> And tequila, where helps too. Um, <laughs> You're a precision foodie, is what you are. <laughs> <laughs> but but I, I you know there, there's no reason why we should not be able to know that right now, right? And and it comes healthcare is you know the biggest tr problem or challenge with healthcare is no matter how great of a technology you have, um, you can't you can't me you can't manage what you can't measure, and um, you're really not allowed to use a lot of this data, so you can't measure it, right? You can't do things very, very scientifically, right, in the healthcare world. And I think regulation in the healthcare world is really is burdening advancement in science. Any any thoughts, Jennifer? Yeah, so I teach uh, statistics for data scientists, right? Um, so you know, we talk about a lot of these concepts. I think what makes these questions so difficult is you have to find the balance, right, the middle ground. For instance, um, in the case of you know, are you being too biased through data? Well, you know, you could say like, well, we want to look at data only objectively. But then there's certain relationships that your data models might show that aren't actually um, a, a causal relationship. For instance, if there's an alien that came from space and saw, you know, saw Earth, saw the people, everyone's carrying umbrellas, right? And then it started to rain. That alien might think, well, it's because they're carrying umbrellas mm. that it's raining. Exactly. Now, we know from real world that that's actually not the way these things work. So if you look only at the data, that's, that's the potential risk, that you'll start making associations or saying something's causal when it's actually not, right? So that's one of the, one of the I think, big challenges. I think when it comes to looking also at things like um, healthcare data, right, you collect data about anything and everything. Doesn't mean that, A, we need to collect all that data for the question we're looking at, or that it's actually um, the best, more optimal way to be able to get to the answer. Meaning sometimes you can take some shortcuts in terms of what data you collect and still get the right answer and not have maybe that level of specificity that's going to cost you millions extra to be able to get. So Jennifer, as a data scientist, I want to, I want to build upon what you just said. Um, and that is, are we going to start to see methods and models emerge for how we actually solve some of these problems? So for example, uh, we know how to build a system for stylized process like accounting or some elements of accounting. Um, we have methods and models that lead to technology and actions and whatnot all the way down that system can be generated. We don't have the same notion to the same degree when we start talking about AI and some of these big data. We have algorithms, we have technology, but are we going to start seeing as a data scientist repeatability and learning and how to think the problems through that's going to lead us to a more likely best or at least good result? 
So I think that that's a bit of a tough question, right? Because part of it is it's going to depend on how many of these researchers actually get exposed to real world scenarios, right? Research gets into all these papers and you come up with all these models, but if it's never tested in a real world scenario, well, I mean, we really can't validate that it works, right? So I think it, it is dependent on how much of this um, integration there's going to be between the research community and industry and how much investment there is, right? Funding is going to matter in this case, right? If there's no funding in the research side, then you know, you'll see a lot of industry folk who feel very confident about their models. That, but again, on the other side, of course, if researchers don't validate those models, then you really can't say for sure that it's actually um, you know, more accurate, right? Or it's more efficient, right? There's the issue of real world testing and experimentation, A-B testing, that's standard practice in many operationalized you know, ML and AI you know, implementations in the business world. But real world experimentation in the edge analytics, where you're actually transducing or touching people's actual lives, the problem there is, like in healthcare and so forth, when you're experimenting with people's lives, somebody's gonna die. I mean, you know, so in other words, that's a, a, that's a critical, in terms of causal analysis, you gotta tread lightly on doing, operationalizing that kind of testing in the IoT when people's lives and health are at stake. We still give them placebos, yeah. so we still test them. Yeah. All right, so let's go to the next question. What are the hottest innovations in AI? So if, you know, I want to start with you as a company, as someone at a company, that has got a kind of an interesting little thing happening when we start thinking about how we better catalog data and represent it to a large number of people. What are some of the hottest innovations in AI as you see it? I, mean, I think it's a little counterintuitive about what the hottest innovations are in AI because we're at a spot in the industry where the most successful companies um, that are working with AI are actually incorporating them into solutions. So the best AI solutions are actually the products that you don't know there's AI operating underneath, but they're having a significant impact on business decision making um, or you know, bringing a different um, type of application to, to the market. and. Um, you know, I think there's a, a lot of investment that's going into AI tooling and, and tool sets for um, data scientists or researchers, but the more innovative companies are thinking through how do we really take AI, AI and ha make it have an impact on business decision making? And that means kind of hiding the AI to the business user. Because if you think a, a bot is making a decision instead of you, you're not going to partner with that bot very easily or very readily. Um, I worked at um, way at the start of my career, I worked in CRM when recommendation engines were all the rage online and also in call centers. And the hardest thing was to get a call center agent to actually read the script <laughs> that the algorithm was presenting to them. Mm -hmm. That algorithm was 99% correct most of the time, but there was this human resistance to letting the computer tell you what to, to tell that customer on the other side, even if it was more successful in the mm -hmm. end. And so you know, I think that the innovation in AI that's really going to push us forward is when humans feel like they can partner with these bots and they don't think of it as a bot, but they think about it as assisting their work and getting to a better result. Hence better. the augmentation point you made earlier. Absolutely. Joe, Absolutely. how about you? What do you look at? Uh, what I are you excited the, about? I think the coolest thing at the moment right now is chatbots. Like to be, you know, to have voice be able to speak with you in, in natural language to do that, I think that's pretty, that's pretty innovative, right? And I, and I do think that eventually, for the average user, not, not for techies you know, like, like me, but, but for the average user, I think keyboards are gonna be a thing of the past. I think we're gonna communicate with computers through voice, and I think this is the very, very beginning of that, and it's an incredible innovation. Neil? Well, um, I think we all have myopia here. We're all thinking about commercial applications. Big, big things are happening with AI in the intelligence community, in military, the defense industry, in all sorts of things, meteorology. Um, and, and that's where on, on an every, well, <laughs> hopefully not on an everyday basis with military, um, you really see the effect of this. But um, I was involved in a project a couple of years ago um, where we were, we were developing AI software to detect artillery pieces in terrain from satellite imagery. I don't have to tell you what country that was. I think you could probably figure that one out, right? Um, but there are legions of people and many, many companies that are involved in that industry. So if you're talking about the dollar spend on AI, I think the stuff that we do you know, in, in our industries is probably fairly small. Well, it reminds me of an application I actually thought was interesting about AI related to that, AI being applied to uh, removing mines 
from war zones. Why not? Uh, which is not yeah. a bad thing for a whole lot of people. Yeah. Uh, Judith, what do you th look at? So I, I'm looking at things like um, being able to have pre-trained data sets in specific solution areas. I think that that's something that's coming. Um, also the ability to, um, you know, to, to really be able to have a machine assist you in selecting the right algorithms based on what, what your data looks like and the problems you're trying to solve. Some of the things that the data scientists still spend a lot of their time on, um, but, but can be um, augmented with some, basically we have to move to levels of abstraction um, before this becomes truly ubiquitous across uh, many different areas. Jennifer? So I'm going to say computer vision. So computer com vision. Computer vision. So computer vision uh, ranges from image recognition to being able to say what content is in the image. Is it a dog? Is it a cat? Is it a blueberry muffin? Is it um, a, like a sort of popular post out there where it's like a blueberry muffin versus like I think a chihuahua and it compares the two and can, can the AI really actually detect the difference, right? So um, I think that's really where a lot of people who are in this space of being in both the AI space as well as data science are looking to uh, for you know, the newer innovations. Um, I think, for instance, Cloud Vision, I think that's what Google still calls it, I think the Vision API, which they've released on beta, allows you to actually use an API to send your image and then have it be recognized right, by their API. Um, there's another startup in, in New York called Clarify that also does a similar thing, as well as you know, Amazon has their recognition um, platform as well. So I think in a, you know, from images, being able to detect what's in the content, as well as from videos, being able to say things like how many people are entering a frame, how many people enter the store. Not having to actually go look at it and count it, but having a computer actually tally that information for you. Right? There is actually an extra piece to that. So if I have a picture of a stop sign, and I'm that auto, uh, I'm an automated car, and is it a picture on the back of a bus of a stop sign, or is it a real stop sign? So that, that's going to be one of the complications. Doesn't matter to a New York City cab driver. How about Probably you, Probably not. <laughs> the hottest thing in AI is generative adversarial networks, GANs. You know, what's hot about them, well, I'll, I'll, I'll be very quick. Most AI, most deep learning, machine learning is analytical. It's distilling or inferring insights from the data. Generative takes that same algorithmic basis, but to build stuff, in other words, to, to, you know, to uh, cre create you know, uh, realistic looking photographs, to compose music, to build CAD CAM models, essentially, that, that can be constructed on 3D printers. Um, so G GANs, and it's a huge research focus all around the world, are you used for, often increasingly used for natural language generation. In other words, it's institutionalizing or having a, a foundation for nailing the Turing test every single time, building something with machines that looks like it was constructed by a human and doing it over and over again to fool humans. I mean, it's like you can imagine the fraud of potential. You can also imagine just the sheer, like, you know, it's gonna shape the world, GANs. All right, so I'm going to say one thing, and then we're going to ask, uh, I'm going to ask if anybody in the audience has an idea. So the thing that I find interesting is uh, traditional programs, or when you tell a machine to do something, you don't need incentives. When you tell a human being something, you have to provide incentives. Like, how do you get someone to actually read the test? That's right. And this whole question of elements within AI that incorporate incentives as a way of trying to guide human behavior is just Ooh. absolutely fascinating to me, whether it's gamification or even some things we're thinking about with blockchain and bitcoins and related types of stuff. To my mind, that's going to have an enormous impact. Some good, some bad. Uh, anybody in the audience? Uh, I don't want to lose everybody here. W what do you think, sir? And I'll try to do my best to repeat it. Oh, we have a mic. The question is pretty much about what Stephanie's talking about, which is human in loop training, right? I, I come from a computer vision background. That's a problem. We need millions of images trained. We need humans to do that. And that's, a, that's like, you know, the workforce is essentially people that aren't necessarily part of the AI community. These are people that are just able to use that data and analyze the data and label that data. That's something that I think is a big problem, which everyone in the computer vision industry at least faces. I was wondering what everyone so, uh, about. So again, the, but the problem is that is the difficulty of methodologically bringing together 
uh, people who understand it and people who people have domain expertise, people who have algorithm expertise and working the, together? The expertise issue comes in healthcare, right? In healthcare, you need experts to be labeling the images. With contextual information, with essentially augmented reality applications coming in, you have the AR kit and everything coming out, but there is a lack of context-based intelligence. And all of that comes through training images, and all of that requires people to do it. And that's kind of like the foundational basis of AI coming forward is not necessarily an algorithm, right? It's how well our data is labeled, who's doing the labeling, and how do we ensure that it happens? Great question. So a so for, for the panel, so if you think about it, a a consultant talks about being on the bench. What, how much time are they going to spend on trying to develop additional business? How much time should we set aside for executives to help train some of these systems? I think that the key is not to think of the problem a different way. So you can have people manually label data, and that's one way to solve the problem. But you can also look at what is the natural workflow of that executive or that individual and is there a way to gather that context automatically yeah. using AI, right? And if you can do that, it's similar to what we do in our product. We observe how someone is analyzing the data, and from those observations, we can actually create the metadata that then trains the system in a, in a particular direction. But you, you have to think about solving the problem differently of finding the workflow that then you can feed into to make this labeling easy without the human really realizing that they're labeling the data. Anybody else? I want to just amplify what Stephanie said. So in uh, the IoT applications, all those sensory modalities, the computer vision, the speech recognition, all that, that's all potential training data. So it's cross-checks against all the other models that are processing all the other data coming from that device. So that you know, the natural language process understanding can be reality checked against the images that the person happens to be commenting upon or the scene which they're embedded. So, but, yeah, but I, the data I is embedded we're, in. We're, we're not at the stage yet where this is easy. Um, it's going to take time before, you know, we do start doing the pre-training of, of, of some of these uh, details so, so that it goes faster. But right now, they're, they're not that many shortcuts. No. Go ahead, Joe. Sorry, so, so a couple things. So one is like, uh, I was just caught up on your incentivizing programs. To, to, to be more efficient like humans. You know, in, in Ethereum that has this notion, you know, which is blockchain, has this theory, this theory, you know, this concept of gas, where like as the process becomes more efficient, it costs less to actually run, right? Right. It costs less, less ether, right? So it actually is kind of, the machine is actually incentivized and you don't really know what it's gonna cost until the machine processes it, right? So there is like some notion of that there. But as far as like vision, like, um, training the machine for, for computer vision, you know, I think it's through adoption and crowdsourcing. So as people start using it more, they're going to be adding more pictures very, very organically. And then the machines will be trained. And you know, right now, it's a very small handful of people doing it. And it's very proactive by the Googles and the Facebooks and all of that. But, um, but as we start using it, as they start looking at my images and Jim's images, Jen's images, it's going to keep getting smarter and smarter you know, through adoption and through, through to very organic process. So, Neil, uh, let me ask you a question. Um, who owns the value that's generated as a consequence of all these people ultimately contributing right. their insight and intelligence into these systems? Uh, uh, well, to a certain extent, uh, the people who are contributing the insight own nothing uh, because the systems collect their actions and the things they do and then that data doesn't belong to them, it belongs to whoever collected it or whoever is going to do something right. with it. Um, but the other thing, getting back to the medical stuff, it's, it's not enough to say that the systems, you know, will, you know, people will do the right thing because a lot of them are not motivated to do the right thing. The whole grant thing, the whole, oh my God, I'm not going to go against the senior professor. Um, a lot of this, I, I knew a guy who was uh, a doctor at uh, the University of Pittsburgh and they were doing a clinical study on um, one of the tubes they put in little kids' ears who have ear infections, right? And uh, Google it. Who can help yeah. us out? <laughs> anyway, I, I forget the exact thing, but he came out and said that the that the principal investigator lied when he made the presentation that it should be this. Or I forget which way it went. He was fired from his position at Pittsburgh, and he has never worked as a doctor again. Badass. He went. He went against the senior line of authority. Oh. 
right? He was another, a whistleblower. Another question back uh, here? Yes. Mark Turner has a question. Not a question. Just want to piggyback what you're saying about uh, the transfixation of maybe in healthcare of black and white images, the color images, in the case of sonograms and ultra ultrasound and mammograms. You see that happening using AI? You see that being, I mean, it's already happening. You see it moving forward in that kind of way. I mean, what, talk more about that, about, you know, AI and black and white images being used and they can be transfixed. They can be made to color images so you can see things better. Doctors can perform better, you know, operations. So I'm sorry, but could you, could you summarize it down? What's the question? Summarize it just. I have a lot of students. That they're interested in the, the cross-pollinization between AI and, say, the medical community as far as things like ultrasound and sonograms and mammograms and how you yeah. can literally take a black and white image and it's using algorithms and stuff being made into color images that ah. can help, you know, doctors right. better do the work that they've already been doing, just do it better. So, so you touched on it. Like for 30 seconds. <laughs> and right. So how, so how AI can be used to actually add information in a way that's not necessarily invasive, but is ultimately improves how someone might respond to it or use it. Yes? Related? Yeah. I also got something to say about, uh, about Im medical images in a second. Any of you guys want to? Go ahead, yeah, Jennifer. Yeah, so, so um, for one thing, um, I, you know, and it kind of goes back to what we were talking about before. When we look at, uh, for instance, um, scans, like uh, at some point I was looking at CT scans, right, for lung cancer nodules. Um, in order to be able to, for me, who I don't have a medical background, to identify where the nodule is, of course, a doctor actually had to go in and specify which, which slice of the scan had the nodule and where exactly it is. So it's um, both the slice level, right, as well as in, within that 2D image, right, where it's located right, and the size of it. Right? So um, the beauty of things like AI is that ultimately, right now, a radiologist has to look at every slice and actually identify this manually. Right? The goal, of course, would be that one day we wouldn't have to have someone look at every slice, which is like 300, you know, usually slices, um, and, and be able to identify it um, you know, much more automated. And I think the reality is we're not going to get something where it's going to be 100%, right? And with anything we do in the real world, it's always like a 95% you know, chance of it being accurate. So I think it's finding that like in between of where, you know, what's the threshold that we want to use to be able to say that, that this is definitively, say, a lung cancer nodule or not. Um, I think the other thing to think about is in terms of how they're using other information, what they might use is say, for instance, um, to say like, you know, based on other characteristics of the person's health, they might use that as sort of a gradient, right? So, you know, how dark or how light something is to identify uh, maybe in that region, you know, the, the prevalence of, the, of the, that specific variable, right? So that's usually how they integrate that information into something that's already existing in, in a computer vision sense. And I think that's, the difficulty with this, of course, is being able to identify which variables you would introduce into data that, is, that does exist. So I'll make two quick observations on this, and I'll go to the next question. One is, um, radiologists have historically been some of the highest paid physicians within a medical community, partly because they don't have to be particularly clinical. They don't have to spend a lot of time with patients. They tend to spend time with doctors, which means they can do a lot of work in a little bit of time and charge a fair amount of money. Uh, as we start to introduce some of these technologies that allow us to, from a machine standpoint, actually make diagnoses based, diagnosis based on those images, uh, I find it fascinating that you now see television ads promoting the role that the radiologist plays in clinical, mes in, in clinical medicine. It's kind of an interesting response. What's also uh, disruptive is I'm seeing more and more studies showing that deep learning models processing images, ultrasounds and so forth, are getting as accurate as many of the best radiologists. That's the point. At detecting that, cancer or and now, whatever it Now might radiologists be. are saying, oh, look, we do this great thing in terms of interacting with the patients, and they never have because they're being disintermediated. Yeah. Uh -huh. The second thing that I'll note is um, one of my favorite examples of that, if I got it right, is uh, looking at the images, the deep space images that come out of Hubble, where they're, they're taking, they're taking uh, data from thousands maybe even millions of images and combining it together in interesting ways, you can actually see depth. You can actually move through a, uh, to a very, very small scale, uh, a system that's, you know, 150, well, maybe not that, it can't be that much, maybe six billion light years away. Fascinating stuff. All right, so let me go to the last question here and then I'm gonna close it down. Um, and we can have something to drink. What are the hottest app, oh, I'm sorry, question? 
Yes, hi. My name's George. I'm with Blue Talon. Um, you asked earlier the question, what's the hottest thing in um, you know, the edge and AI? I would say that it's um, security. I don't, I, I, it seems to me that before you can empower agency, you need to be able to authorize what they can act on, how they can act on, who they can act on. So it seems if you're going to move from uh, very distributed uh, data at the edge and analytics at the edge, there have to be security similarly done at the edge. So I must, uh, and I saw a full of slides that, that called out security as a as a, a key prerequisite, and maybe Judith can can comment. But so I'm curious how security is going to evolve to meet this analytics at the edge. Well, let me do that, and then I'll ask Jim to comment. Um, the notion of agency is crucially important. It's slightly different from security, just so that we're clear. And the basic idea here is, historically, folks have thought about moving data or they've thought about moving application function. Now we are thinking about moving authority. So as you said, and that's not necessarily, that's not really a security question. But this has been a problem that's been in, a, of a concern in a number of different domains. How do we move authority with the resources, and that's really what informs the whole agency process. Yeah. But with that said, Jim? Yeah, actually, I'll, yeah, thank you for um, bringing up security. So identity is the foundation of security, strong identity, multi-factor, face recognition, biometrics, and so forth. Clearly, AI, machine learning, deep learning, are powering a new era of biometrics, and you know, it's behavioral metrics and so forth that's organic to people's use of devices and so forth. Um, you know, getting to the point that Peter was raising is important agents, agency, systems of agency. Your agent, you have to, you as a human being, should be vouching in a secure, <coughs> tamper-proof way. Um, your identity should be vouching for the identity of some agent, physical or virtual, that does stuff on your behalf. How can that, how should that be managed within this increasingly distributed IoT fabric? Well, a lot of that has been worked at already through webs of trust, public key infrastructure, you know, formats, and, you know, like, like SAML for single sign-on and so forth. It's all about assertions, strong assertions and vouching. I mean, there's the whole the workflows of things. Back in the ancient days when I was actually a PKI analyst, three analyst firms ago, uh, you know, I got deep in all the guts of all those federation agreements. Something like that has to be IoT scalable to enable systems of agency to be truly fluid so we can vouch for our agents wherever they happen to be. And we're going to keep on having, as human beings, agents all over creation. We're not even going to be aware of everywhere that our agents are, but well, it's not just, our identity it's not just, has to follow. But it's not it's, just identity, it's also authorization yeah, and context. Yeah, commissioning, of course. Yeah, so, so I may be um, the right person to do something yesterday, but I'm not authorized to do it in another context, yes. in another application. Role-based sure. permissioning, yeah, right. understood. That's or right. persona-based, yes, That's I right. agree. Yeah. And obviously, uh, it's going to be interesting to see the role that, that blockchain or its follow-on set of technology is going to play here. Okay, so let me, let me throw one more question out. Uh, what are the hottest applications of AI at the edge? Uh, we've talked about a number of them. Does anybody want to add something that hasn't been talked about? I'm or do you want to get a beer? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, Stephanie, yeah, you raise your hand. I was going to go and bring something mundane to the table, actually, because I think one of the most exciting innovations with IoT and AI are actually simple things. Like, City of San Diego is rolling out 3,200 automated streetlights that will actually help you find a parking space, reduce the um, amount of emissions. Um, into the atmosphere, so it has some environmental change, positive environmental change impact. I mean, it's street lights. It's not like a, you know, it's not medical industry. It it's, doesn't look like a life-changing innovation. And yet, if we automate street lights and we manage our energy better and maybe they can flicker on and off if there's a parking space there yep. for you, that's a significant impact on everyone. And life. dramatically suppress the impact of backseat driving. <laughs> exactly. Is that what were you saying? <laughs> well, I was just going to say, you know, there's already the technology out there where you can put a camera on a drone with machine learning within an artificial intelligence within it, and it can look at buildings and, and determine whether there's rusty pipes and cracks in cement and, you know, leaky roofs and, and all of those things, and that's all based on artificial intelligence. And I think if you can do that, 
to be able to look at an x-ray and determine if there's a tumor there is not out of the realm of possibility, right? To be yep. um, I, I agree with both of them. That's what I meant about external kind of applications, right? Instead of you know, figuring out what to sell our customers, uh, which is most what we hear. Um, I, I just, I, I, I think all of those things are, are imminently doable. And boy, streetlights that help you find a parking place. I mean, that's brilliant, right? It's, uh, yeah, it, it improves your life. You know, more than, 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 I don't know, I don't know what I'm saying, something I used on, on the internet recently, but I, mean, it's, I think it's great. Uh, that's, I'd like to see a thousand things like that. You know? Jim? Yeah, actually building on what Stephanie and Neil were saying, it's, it's ambient intelligence built into everything to, to enable fine-grained microclimate awareness of all of us as human beings moving through the world and enable greening of every microclimate in, in buildings. In other words, you know, you have sensors on your body that are always detecting, you know, the heat, the humidity, the level of pollution or whatever in every environment that you're in or that you might be likely to move into fairly soon. And either A, can it get, help give you guidance in real time about where to avoid or um, give that, that environment guidance about how to adjust itself to your, like the lighting or whatever it might be, to your specific requirements. And, you know, when you have a room like this full of other human beings, there has to be some negotiated settlement. Some will find it too hot, some will find it too cold or whatever. But I think that is fundamental in terms of reshaping the sheer quality of experience of most of our lived habitats on the planet, or potentially. You know? and that's really an edge analytics application that depends on everybody having, being fully equipped with a personal and area network of sensors you know, that's communicating into the cloud. You know? Jennifer? So I think um, it's, What's really interesting about it is being able to utilize the technology we do have, right? It's a lot cheaper now to have a lot of these um, ways of measuring that we didn't have before. And whether or not engineers can then leverage what we have as ways to measure things. And then, of course, then you need people like data scientists to build the right model. So you can collect all this data. If you don't build the right model that identifies the, these patterns, then all that data is just collected and it's just going to be in a repository, right? So without having the models that supports um, the patterns that are actually in the data, you're not going to find a, you know, a better way of being able to find insights right, in the data itself. So I think what will be really interesting is to see um, how existing technology is leveraged to collect data and then how that's actually modeled, as well as to be able to see how technology is going to now develop from where it is now to um, you know, being able to either collect things more sensitively or um, you know, in the case of, say, for instance, if you're you know, dealing with like, how people move, whether we can build things that we can then use to measure how we move, right? Like how we move every day, and then being able to model that in a way that is actually going to give us better insights into things like healthcare um, and just you know maybe even our, just our behaviors. Judith. So, so I think we also have to look at it from a peer-to-peer -peer perspective. So I may be able to to uh, get some data from one thing at the edge, but then all those edge devices, sensors, or whatever. They, they all have to interact with each other because we don't live, we, we may in our business lives act in silos, but in the real world when you look at things like sensors and devices, it's how they react with each other on a peer-to-peer -peer basis. All right, before I invite John up, I want to say, I'll say what, what my thing is, and it's not the hottest, it's the one I hate the most. I hate AI-generated music. <laughs> hey. All right, so I want to thank all the panelists, every single person, some great commentary, great observations. I want to thank you very much. I want to thank everybody that joined. Uh, John, in a second, you'll kind of announce who's the big winner. Um, but the one thing I want to do is, uh, as I was listening, uh, I learned a lot from everybody. But I want to call out the one comment that I think we all need to remember. And I'm going to give you the award, Stephanie. And that is that increasingly we have to remember that the best AI is probably AI that we don't even know is working on our behalf. The same flip side of that is all of us have to be very cognizant of the idea that AI is acting on our behalf and we may not know it. So, John, why don't you come on up? Okay, Who great. won the, whatever it's called, the raffle? You won. Thank you. <laughs> the, the panel. How about a round of applause for the great panel? Ooh. Okay, we have... Uh, uh, put the business cards in the basket. We're going to have that brought up. We're going to have two raffle gifts, some nice Bose headsets, and a nice speaker, Bluetooth speaker. I'm good, waiting for that. I just want to say thank you for coming. 
And for the folks watching, this is our fifth year doing our own event called Big Data NYC, which is really an extension of the landscape beyond the big data world as cloud and AI and IoT and other great things happen. And great experts and influencers and analysts here, thanks for sharing your opinion. Really appreciate you taking the time to come out and uh, share your, your data and your, and, your, and your knowledge. Appreciate it, thank you. Um, where's the... Sam's right in front of you. Here's the thing, okay. All right, you gotta be present to win. We saw some people sneaking out the back door to go to, the, to, go to a dinner. First prize first. Let's okay, first prize is the Bose headset. Okay. Bluetooth and noise canceling. Okay. I won't look. Stan, you gotta hold it down. I can see the cards. Right. Stephanie, you won. <laughs> okay. Sonny Cox. Sonny Alley Cox. Sonny Cox. Hey, look at that. He's here. Okay, the bar's open, so help yourself, but we got one more. Hold on, I saw you. you need to wake up a little bit. Yeah. Okay. All right. Next one is. Oh, this is my kids love this. This is uh, great. Great for the beach. Great for everything. Portable speaker. Great gift. It is portable a speaker. portable speaker. It's pretty awesome. Oh, you grab oh, mine. That's one of our guys. Can't, <laughs> yeah. can't be related. <laughs> Ava. Ava. <laughs> Ava. Okay. Gene Panesco. Hey, you came in. All right, look at that. The timing's great. <laughs> hey, thanks everybody. Enjoy the night. Thank Peter Burst, head of research for Silicon Angle Media, Wikibon, and the great guests and influencers and friends, and you guys for coming in the community. Thanks for watching and thanks for coming. Enjoy the party, have some drinks, and that's out. That's it for the, the influencer panel and, and uh, analyst discussion. Thank you.